Okay, I'll be covering the concept, design, installation, and setup operation. And Roma will be covering the cost benefit portion of the presentation. Okay, the topic is freeway response system. What it is, it's a self, it's a pretty much like a freeway mobility, address congestion. So our main goal is to help alleviate freeway traffic through signalized intersection. Because what happens is every time when freeway bottlenecks up and people try to jump off the freeway and go down Fontage Road, but the signal is not changing based on what's demand because the freeway condition is deteriorating. Issue, where to display freeway traffic when freeway traffic is no longer free flowing due to incident, construction, and various things that slow down free flow. This is concept, basic concept. For basic concept, it's something monitor freeway and then send that information to intersection and intersection respond to the, the input. So what basically we need is you have a sensor amount of freeway condition and sensor output when the, when the conditions met and sending that contact information to the intersection and intersection receives the information and intersection receive, react to the input. We are using a wave tunneling radar to monitor both directions of freeway, and basically we monitor the speed, volume, or occupancy based on your requirement, what you want. And we use a contact close, we use a contact closure radio to generate input into a control cabinet. That's what basic system is, and we can use the two contact input to gen to generate three timing, three timing plans. So basically, it's on off is one plan, off on is another plan, and both on on is another plan. And this is basic design, original basic design. These are the freeway sensor, and then you communicate to your inter local intersection. And at this time, this is designed based on if you have a network already implemented, and they can use a peer-to-peer -peer feature to talk to individual intersection also. So all all the corresponding intersection will respond to the input also. So our test site is I-10. It's west of uh, Highway 6 to Mason Road. And total of uh, we have a total of uh, six intersections. So equipment we're using is a uh, Waytron HD sensor with criteria signaling capability. And Click 513, that's a contact closure, basically just a contact closure. And in two 900 megahertz radio. And also the, the control we use, the uh, Econ ASC3. On installation part, I did not install a new sensor because uh, Toro, Harris County Toro already has an existing sensor out there, so we just adapt into the existing sensors. But for, by doing that, with the way Tronic HD, it only has two output. One output is RS 485 and the other one 232. And 485 sensor, uh, 485 communication output already been taken by the total authority, so we had to somehow take the 232, convert back to 485. Because 518, click 518 required 485 communication. That's why we had to add a click 300 in there to convert from 230 to 485. And after that, you need to install the antenna to your local intersection and where your sensor at to make it, to make it work. So this is what sensor location looks like. And that's two sensors, but we only, we only use, actually, we only use a one sensor. And this is what the cabin, the sensor location installation. And this is uh, coming down from sensor, and that's 232 output, and feed it back to a click 301, you'll convert back to 485 and talk to this click. And here's your output from the click, contact closure output going to your radio. And that's another look of a uh, setup. And on an intersection level, all you, we, you have to install a Yagi antenna or Omni. At the sensor location, we have Omni. And we use Yagi here on local intersection. And this is how cabin looks like. Only equipment you added is this radio right here. Nothing else we added. So from there, we go into back panel. You have a test A and test B input in there. So basically, I set up as a westbound traffic as test A input, and eastbound traffic as a test B input. And of course, you need to bring your logic ground to make the contact closure works. So setup and operation. 
So basically, you need to set up your sensor to tell you how many lanes you want to monitor and what direction you want to monitor. And then you need also need to set up your contact closure and when to what's your threshold and contact closure so you know when to trigger it. And also you need a program radio, make sure they communicate, can send that contact information from your sensor location to your intersections. And after that, you got to connect your output to your cabin so your control can receive the input. So this is what Waytronix uh, set up. Text on one, two, three is the westbound traffic. And one and two is management, management and managing lane on I-10. And three, four, five, and six is the eastbound traffic on, on regular. And lane seven is the entrance ramp. So basically, all I need is a monitor one, two, three for my westbound traffic, three, four, five, and six for my eastbound traffic. So that's how we program it. On approach one, takes out one, two, and three. And approach two, three, four, and five. Three, four, three, four, five, and six. And approach, this is how we, okay, this is where the contact closure comes in. We set under speed at 30 miles per hour and over occupancy 25%. So as soon as under speed 30, okay, let me go to this side first. Interval 10 out of four, four, 10, we're going to collect 10 interval data. Four out of 10 meets the criteria, it'll trigger the output. And we use an OR statement. So either one of these statements is true, either under speed 30 miles per hour or 25% over occupants, you'll trigger the output also. So this is what typically looks like on freeway. You got this is peak and peak. So the freeway flow looks like this, and once it hits certain time, it drops and go back out again once it deviates. And this side is the mile per hour, the speed, and this one is the occupancy. So basically I just say, okay, what's my, how do I, when do I want to, to trigger it? So I just draw a square box. Okay, this is the area I want to have a trigger. So anything within this square, square box, it'll trigger the, the sensor and it'll send the information to my intersection. And at that time, it'll change a different time of plan. You'll, you'll operate a little bit different. And this is what happens when, freeway on, when you have an incident on freeway. It's hard to differentiate between your regular rush hour traffic and incident incident problems. So initially, I just want to isolate to incident management, but it's kind of hard to do so because uh, it's hard to separate them apart. So might as well just include them into a system. And this is how we set our radio. Basically, every intersection get to see all three sensor input. So you get to pick which sensor want to trigger that particular intersection. You can have all three sensors trigger that intersection, or you can just have one sensor trigger that particular intersection only. So that's how we program our radio this way. And the data is, the HD is collect the data every 30 seconds. This, this 30 second is your triggering rate. Since I say four out of 10, so the fastest the system can respond has to be two minutes because the four of the 30 second interval is a two minutes. And this, can, this is user selectable, it can go from one second or up to 99 minutes. So depending how fast your system to respond to, your, to the condition, that, that you can control on it. And basically, and our click factor and pull data every five seconds just to verify, make sure I still got communication to it. And when all criteria are met, then contact closure will drop. And this is a logic statement we use in our controller. Test A. That's a controller input bit, code is 161, because the controller cabin just see nothing but bits. And test B is code 161. So if 160 is on and 161 is off, you call action plan 10 on your controller. And bits 160 is, 60 is off, 61 is on, then call the vice versa. Right. That's how you trigger three different action plans in your controller. And that will call a different timing plan based on your needs. So if this one, we design for outbound, so westbound traffic, eastbound traffic is backs up, and if both sides, both directions of the traffic backs up, we call third plan to handle the situation. And this is typically what our one of the screenshot of the plan looks like. So basically, we drop into section run free operation, and we call on max three. Max three typically I give an extra twenty second now. So once the system trigger, our front drill will get extra twenty seconds of green time. So to help move out the vehicle. And you can, you can either call different pattern 
or you can do a coordination plan if you need to. If you need to flush and through the whole entire coordination system, you can do so also. So we just test and see which one is the best way to handle the, the congestion at that time. And results. This is how, that's what you see in the control side. You see a lot of triggering. So basically, when you see it active, that's when the system see it, and then inactive, that's when the system shut off. So there's a lot of activity right here based on triggering. So you got some of it long, some are short. And you can see this one trigger has turn on at 441 and turn off at 452. So during that 11 minutes, it's operating extra 20 second green time on my intersection. So I can free more traffic during that time. And this AM, AM data, similar to that. And on this day, I was on the field and I saw a DMS sign say, there's a freeway incident, I-10 is closing. So the following day, I went out and pulled data out. So basically, you can see the system kick it in at 225 when alarm active. So the, the, my control see the issue, the contact closure put in the input, that's outbound. Kick in uh, the act, active and it didn't shut off till 3.30. So during that hour and five minutes, my functors will get extra timing. So help, because everybody, if we are close, everybody gonna get off freeway now. Everybody gonna stay on frontage row. So during that time, I, they got extra 20 seconds, which will help move out a little bit more traffic. Otherwise, they gonna stay the same timing. So that's, they're still not going anywhere if they stay on the same timing. So at least 20 seconds give them more time. And I don't, yeah, I don't have the video for that yet. Okay, the other uses. We can use, um, because that's the next thing, these are the next thing I kind of want to try. You can install these things on your mounted exit, freeway exit ramp. A lot of issues, sometimes you have traffic back up your exit ramp, and when you back up your exit ramp, that's kind of not, not too good for you through from freeway traffic. And basically, you can send some sort of signal to your, to your intersection. You can either run low priority preemption or the transit signal priority, that's like a bus preemption, or you can just run a different timing pattern. So it depends where you want to monitor your sensor at. And you can trigger a little bit earlier or later, depending on what your, what your need. And right now, a lot of these control come with a peer-to-peer -peer feature now. So if you trigger one, it can talk to the adjacent intersection. Also, it can run the same timing plan with it. So it can help them flush out, not just one location. It can flush out everybody at the same time. And cost. With uh, one sensor, one power supply, and click 530 and two radio and one antenna, about $11,000 per installation. At this project, I didn't, since I did not pay for a sensor, all I need, all I use is just as somebody adapt into existing sensor. So it costs a little bit cheaper, but for typically it costs about 11,000 to install one system. And then another 3,500, if you want one sensor, talk to multiple, another intersection, then you need, all I need just to put another radio in there and you'll, you'll respond to that system. And I'll let Roma discuss the cost benefits out of it. So basically, Steve was uh, saying that the frontage road gets 20 seconds of additional green time. So the question comes, what are the benefits? Because the cross street is going to suffer if we are giving more time to the frontage road. So we wanted to see what are the benefits, can we put some numbers on these benefits, and what really happens to the cross street, how much does it suffer, is there an overall benefit? And then is it always the solution, or are there certain situations when we shouldn't do that? So there are two ways we could actually go out in the field and instrument the corridor and get some very detailed travel time data, but that would be very costly. So we did the next best thing, we did micro simulation of the corridor, and we used VSIM to do the micro simulation state of the art, and we collected exit and entry ramp volumes, all of the turning movement counts for the intersections, the timing plans Steve provided us, and then the main lane volumes from the Wavetronic sensors. We also use the travel time data from the travel map for calibrating the model. So basically for the simulation process, we did the freeway segment between Highway 6 and Mason Road, but we focused only on the westbound side and just for Barker Cypress. We focused on Barker Cypress because that's the first intersection that's dot maintained. That's where the timing plan can be changed, the first intersection. So if you see, so this is the exit to Barker Cypress. 
Barker Cypress here, and then there's another exit to Greenhouse Road, and then the entry comes from the Barker Cypress. And just to give you an idea of what are the typical volumes in the PM peak period in that segment, the exit to Barker Cypress is about 1,500. The freeway segment, the main lanes are about 7,700. And the frontage itself, including the exit, is about 4,000. And then Barker Cypress southbound is 1,300. Northbound is very light in the PM, and so is the eastbound frontage. And then these are some other volumes. And then these would be the measures of effectiveness. We looked at the throughput and the delay. Throughput for the freeway, does it change? And for the frontage, what happens to the cross street? Same thing for the delay. This is what we found for the 4 to 5 p.m. peak period. Throughput for the freeway increased by about 500 vehicles per hour. It increases because uh, people who are trying to get on the freeway they don't have to since the frontage is flowing better. So you are decreasing the weaving on the main lanes and that helps the traffic flow better and we get a better throughput. For the cross street and the eastbound frontage, it decreased by 115 vehicles per hour because we were taking time away from them. And then for the westbound frontage, it increased by 380 vehicles per hour. And the delay, for the freeway, there wasn't that much change in the delay for the freeway. It added up to 64 vehicle hours just because of the traffic volume on the freeway. And then the westbound frontage was what benefited the most, as you would expect. It had the delay, the travel time decreased by 130 seconds per vehicle. So that was fantastic. And the total travel time in vehicle hours decreased by 86 hours. And for the southbound approach, as you would expect, since that has the most traffic, it increased uh, the, the travel time increased by 62 seconds per vehicle. And the total delay increased by 13 vehicle hours. But for the total overall intersection, we still saw some benefit, which is 68 vehicle hours. It decreased. <laughs> then I tried to put some uh, dollar numbers on it, uh, taking the user value of time, 21.9 per hour, and did all the calculations. Then it comes down to the break. What did I do? <laughs> oh. Just when I was talking about the break-even period, it only takes two days in the PM peak for it to trigger to come up with the break-even period. So that's what's good about it. And in conclusion, we can say that using frontage road to alleviate freeway traffic during less desirable level of service can be an alternative solution to the congestion problem. Yes. And then going forward, we are trying to see if uh, we can do a sensitivity analysis to identify when and where it would be most beneficial. And what happens if the intersection is fully saturated? Are you still giving any benefit if all four approaches are saturated? Would the delay from the other three approaches would just negate the effort you are trying to do on the frontage? And then what happens if we have closely spaced intersections along the cross street? Because then the queue would spill back and uh, off-peak incident condition would give how much benefit. That would probably be the most beneficial we could have. And then hopefully maybe develop a guidance document to figure out some parameters that can be used to decide where it should be used or not used. And then Steve is working with the vendors to see if uh, he can come up with, they can come up with the technology to time of date triggering. That is during the peak hours, versus incident or at night time if there's an incident run a different plan because you can give more time to the frontage at night time when there's no cross street traffic versus in the peak period. But right now, Steve, you want to talk about that a little? Yes, Brenda? Yeah. Right now there's a couple of, couple of them. the control manufacturer helped me resolve this issue and hopefully they can get some sort of answer by hopefully by next year 
and basically we can more flexible to our system. Basically, you can call a different time of day plan, and you can correspond. Not not just not just like a typical three plan now. We can call like an unlimited plan up to two, uh, 120 plan as long as your control can handle it. So that's the direction we're heading right now. So make so basically, this system can just change your timing on the fly. Because there's nobody going to sit there and watch it and just a sensor triggering all these plans. Right, and uh, questions? Yes. The response time will be a little bit too slow because uh, if you do it in localized, next intersection doesn't know what happened previous next intersection beforehand. So with this system, you can trigger the next intersection to make sure, hey, if I, if I give 20 seconds extra on this intersection, I'm going to send extra 20 seconds green time intersection down to yours in the next intersection. But that you won't do it until you seize it. So that's kind of a little bit too late for that. So I want to be more proactive than reactive. So that's a, I think that's a benefit out of this system. <coughs> Correct, correct. That's just arbitrary number, and that's why we do on TTI do a research on it, and quite the best way to run the corridor if you need to flush them, because once you reach a saturation point, coordination is not much use anymore to that point. You just bottleneck the whole entire intersection. So free, free operation, I think probably the best way to run it, and then somebody got to suffer, and <laughs> you, you have a lot more traffic. You have a lot more traffic on freeway, and if if you if you're a cross street, if you if you feel on, on Fountain Street, you see cross street not much traffic, and you are you are sitting here, got a lot more power on your direction, and you get frustrated. Say, how come they don't? How come they get more time than me? So eventually, that's how we balance out the intersection. Yeah, and that's when we'll do the sensitivity analysis and try to figure out if a different time interval would be better, a different cycle length. We're going to take one more question, uh, but before that, I'd like to have a little clarification. I had, he is like a whiz, whiz computer person, okay? <laughs> and um, he did come up with things, and I charged the young engineers to come up with something that is going to be qualitative. We want to start hearing less complaints on ITN in the mornings, going in and then coming out, and then they were able to come up with something. Now, the question was, how were we going to go and measure it? Buy a bunch of sensors and run out there to measure it, to be able to quantify it and everything. And then TTI, with their expertise, says, okay, let's just model it. So we're having less complaints on I-10. People go to work. Some people stay on the frontage road. Some people stay on the main lane. So please don't run out there and tell them in the Houston <laughs> district that, that if, if it's slow, you should stay on the frontage road because everybody will turn to the frontage road and then the freeway is going to... So, it's something that we've had for about four years now, uh, three. We started testing in 2009. So, so it's, it's working because there's a lot of people leaving and moving towards um, the western part of uh, Houston. So don't tell anybody. They're going to work and they're coming back. We're working behind the, the scenes, so leave it at that. 